Hello everyone and um, good morning, good afternoon or good evening. Depends where you are in the in the world. You have people uh, across the world joining us. So um, welcome to this uh, this webinar. One of the first of the of the eight nine webinars we will uh, organize uh, from now until end of next year. And so today we will discuss a hot topic uh, in this uh, supply chain industry, which is a uh, just in time shipping optimizing the empty container logistic in the digital era so you will be able to ask questions uh, over the, the presentation through the chat that you can find uh, on your screen so feel free we will uh, will make some uh, some pause you know to uh, in order to uh, to reply to uh, to those questions so uh, feel free to uh, to do so so i'm john ceo at uh, transmetrics um we will uh, we will um, do this presentation with uh, Dimitar, we, with our head of business development, and with Balash, with our head of uh, product development. So, Transmetrics. So we are an AI company, uh, headquarters in Europe, and we are specialized in uh, in supply chain. So today we are focusing on the on the container shipping industry, and maybe uh, in order to start and for everyone to be aligned on the on the challenges that we can see in this industry. Would like to start with a uh, with couple of uh, of figures that we are we have discovered through the BCG, so through Boston Consulting Group. So one third of the containers which are which has actually carrying uh, across the world is generally moved empty. So one third of those containers are moved empty, and it costs to our industry up to twenty billion US dollars per year. On top of that, you know, so uh, a lot of ocean shipping lines have been seriously impacted with uh, the COVID-19 pandemic, negatively affect, affecting the, the profit and loss statement, and putting more pressure, more and more pressure on the operation and forcing companies to actually make tough decisions and cut operating costs. Recently, and you can see that in the press, some of those ocean shipping lines have actually laid down people in order to actually um, survive this crisis. And, this is also why we are working on it right now, because uh, we are actually bringing new uh, solution in order to uh, to improve this uh, this situation. And when you look at the situation, those repositioning costs represent up to eight percent of the total OPEX structure in UPNL, and thirty percent of this cost is caused by inefficiencies. And these inefficiencies can actually be saved with uh, with new technologies. So that's for the you know that's for the money side, and if you think beyond that, you know it's not only about the money, but it's also the planet. You no, know, actually having a better optimization plan to reposition this empty container will also help us to save and to reduce CO two emissions. So why do we have this uh, this challenge? It's also uh, in a big part linked to the global trade imbalances, and you have actually uh, three different scenarios. So here you are. So the first one, which is a top scenario, is a fully balanced scenario. So that's in an ideal world, you know. So let's imagine that you are sending a container full of goods from um, from from uh, from Le Havre in France, for instance, and this container is actually being shipped to Africa with automotive parts, you know, to actually supply one of the Renault factory, for instance, in Morocco. And back to France, this container will be filled with, um, with, for instance, clauses from Morocco back to France. So this is the ideal situation, and we are in a fully balanced uh, repositioning. So we are not having uh, difficulty to reposition this container because basically back and forth, the container is full. So unfortunately, this scenario represents only uh, you know, a little percentage of what's happening uh, worldwide. And what you generally see, is the two scenarios that you, are, you see on, our, on, this, uh, on this, uh, this page at the bottom. The middle one, which is a, a scenario where we have a fully imbalance repositioning, and then the hybrid one, which is a mix between the first and the second scenario. So imbalance, and if we stick to this, uh, this first uh, example we took, so let's imagine now the container is living in France, arriving to Africa, and you don't have anything to, to load uh, the container and to, uh, to go back to France. So now you have an empty container in Africa, certainly to reposition somewhere when you need this, uh, this container. The last one, the bottom one, is a hybrid. 
So part of the container will actually be able to be uh, loaded and back to the origin destination, and part of them will uh, will not find any goods to uh, to be loaded. So the imbalanced one, the hybrid one, is actually what we generally see in the industry. So and this is where where uh, Transmetrics actually provide the, the solution in order to actually optimize the reposition of the of the empty container. So Midco will actually uh, introduce now the just-in-time uh, scenario and what it brings to our, to our industry. Thanks a lot, John. So guys, on this, um, on this slide, you can see two completely different um, logistics setups. One on the left-hand side um, related to just-in-case logistics, which is associated with um, high safety stocks. Obviously, safety stocks that are estimated by, by local agents um, that are based on their gut feeling and experience rather than being data driven. And obviously, these local agents have a high conflict of interest with the overall organization because, as a personal um, facing the customers, they want to ensure that they have enough capacity to satisfy even 200% of the customer demand that is likely to occur. Obviously, that's very costly and inefficient for the overall organization. And as an antidote to that, we supply the means um, and the tools to our customers to move to a more efficient picture on the right-hand side, um, um, namely that's the just-in-time logistics concept mastered originally by Toyota in the 1970s and 1980s um, in the automotive world, which is kind of a, a business as usual right now in the automotive and part of the manufacturing world as well. Now, what's special about just-in-time? Well, first, we are talking about significantly lower amount of safety stocks at all locations. Um, safety stocks that, among others, are based on the calculations of which is based not only on um, gut feeling experience, but actually it's data driven. It's based on accurate demand forecasting, which can span up to 12 weeks in advance. Um, lower number of safety stocks that still ensures that we satisfy 100% of the demand all the time. And obviously, through building very smooth supply chain, taking into consideration all costs and the demand forecast, we can also reduce the repositioning, storage, maintenance, and grading costs that gives a, a very good competitive advantage to our clients. Um, on the next slide, you can uh, actually see that we do that with the help of artificial intelligence. Uh, and we're talking about artificial intelligence algorithms that can fully comprehend the vast um, amounts of data generated by um, shipping operations. To give you a better understanding, uh, think about IBM Watson or Google Deep, DeepMind um, AlphaGo that have trained their algorithms on billions of data points in order to solve, um, it's fairly to say, um, a theoretical problem uh, beating gamers in their um, uh, respective games. So here we're talking about solving a real life problem where we will train, we will build and train our algorithms on uh, logistics data and for logistics data. Uh, but also, we would leave the planners to be in the front seat. We would use their experience, their uh, human touch and responsibility, um, and we will enhance their capabilities by, um, you know, uh, outputting suggestions with these smart, smart algorithms. And this is something that we call augmented intelligence. And on the next slide, you can actually see that augmented intelligence and predictive analytics is exactly what we apply to help companies um, to get rid of inefficiencies to significantly improve their planning processes um, and to uh, get more efficient, basically. Um, our solutions, our predictive optimization solutions are developed exclusively for that industry for supply chain management, transportation, and logistics. And they answer to the questions of where, when exactly, how should I position my logistics assets? How can I resupply? What would be the exact amount of safety stocks? And here we're talking about dynamic safety stocks. Um, and in general, what's the most um, optimal planning? Obviously, when we uh, provide the tools and we can um, write the answer to these questions, uh, we bring millions of benefits to our customers. And you can see that they actually they span across the whole supply chain. We're talking about, um, obviously, empty container management, fleet management, um, maintenance and repair. We're talking about warehouse process optimization solutions that we develop, as well as last mile and line hole optimization solutions for um, the career parcel and um, Groupage business. We've been recognized based on this success and uh, also on our innovative uh, solutions. We've been recognized by the European uh, Horizon 2020 Research and Innovation Program. Uh, and we were granted nearly 2 million euro to further invest in research and development and uh, into our growth. On the next slide, you can actually see how operationally Transmetric work, works. 
uh, basically we would establish a channel from from our customers to us that would be from their let's say rep replica database or uh, transportation management system or ERP whatever the setup is um, and then their data would land into our data cleansing and enrichment module this is important because uh, it will be fair to say that um, the industry operates in a fairly um, fairly bad data quality environment. So that's why we would um, take the um, necessary steps to significantly increase data quality. And the aim for that would be to first provide very detailed and accurate BI and reporting. And in the light of ocean shipping, that would be, um, that would be a very good uh, cost visibility, state and inventory visibility. Uh, but also this step is necessary because it can enable further manipulations, manipulations like business optimization modeling. So all sorts of optimizations as well as demand forecasting. And then our outputs could be um, accessed through two main channels. One would be our web-based application, which uh, Bawash will show you in a minute. And the other option will be to supply this data back to our client system where they can visualize it in their own environment. It's important to know that this is a daily learning loop. So with every new batch of data that we receive, our algorithms output better and better results. And here I will pass the ball to Bausch to give you more um, information about the operational setup. Bao, I think you're muted. You can hear me now? Yeah. Okay. So <clears throat> uh, let me explain how we do it for shipping lines. Um, uh, all starts with, with modeling, yeah? For the operation of our customers, um, shipping lines in this case, uh, our data science colleagues build a mathematical model for their whole operations, yeah? It is a cost-based optimization model which takes uh, all costs into account that occur um, during the operation. It includes storage cost, repositioning cost, handling cost, stevedoring cost, maintenance, repair, and so on. But also artificial costs like uh, not satisfying a customer demand, um, meaning uh, losing business. Yeah? Um, to do the job, the model also needs to know the network, so the ports, uh, sailing schedule, all local repositioning options uh, by uh, by truck, train, uh, or barge. Yeah. All this information should arrive with a daily loop. Uh, Dimitar presented on the previous slide, um, and uh, should be automatically loaded into our system. Yeah. So let's look at uh, look at the regular full container cycle on this screen. The shipper picks up the empty container, fills it with goods. Uh, and returns it uh, full at the terminal. Then the full container travels, potentially using feeder services and transport, transshipment ports, and uh, arrives at the destination port, that's here at the uh, uh, bottom right, where the receiver picks it up, removes the goods, and returns it empty at the depot. Yeah. Um, our process, um, starts with uh, with predicting future demand this is at this point uh, you see the yellow arrow uh, we forecast the load of the full containers in case of a shipping line it's a natural choice because um, the bookings happen uh, at this uh, at this step but for other businesses like uh, container leasing companies uh, we may forecast the empty pickups uh, directly um, to determine the empty pickups uh, related to the full container load, we train our model using historical data uh, to learn the pickup patterns, uh, and we apply the same patterns uh, to the future. Yeah, these patterns uh, vary a lot uh, based on the location and container size type. We apply the same um, uh, logic uh, uh, for the re empty returns at the destination. So at the end, we end up with the future empty stock levels at each location. That's the starting point of the optimization. 
if I go to the next slide, um, so we know at this point the future stock levels, uh, and we also know uh, so the imbalances. To fix the imbalances, um, um, as John explained, uh, we usually need to move empty containers back to high demand locations, and uh, those empties um, uh, also need to be inspected, repaired, and graded. This slide shows the empty container cycle, and all these activities are part of the optimization model. We give proposals not only for empty positioning, but also um, maintenance and repair activities, for example. However, the challenge is to move the empty containers to the high demand location when they are actually needed. Not sooner, not later, but just in time. Um, the op uh, optimization is responsible for, for this. Yeah? It takes all these uh, constraints into account and comes with a detailed plan, which results in, uh, in the lowest uh, possible operational costs on the global level. Uh, of course, it may propose activities that uh, do not seem optimal on the local scale, but they do result in a cost saving on the global scale. Um, let me switch to the demo system. Give me a second. So this is a replication. Um, we don't have time to uh, to look at all the screens. I will just give you some uh, some highlights. Yeah. Um, we have a reporting section uh, with several reports, both historical uh, and future looking, to help you uh, to monitor the activities and uh, and take uh, corrective actions. In the forecasting section, uh, you can review the forecast and manually adjust it if needed. In the planning section, uh, you can review the optimization proposals and plan the activities. That's kind of the heart of the product. And of course, uh, we have reference data section to maintain your, uh, uh, the, uh, your cost related data. That's the upper part and, uh, and your network. Uh, let's go to the forecast. Um, so, uh, so let's say we want to review the forecast uh, X China. Um, the report plots historical years on top of each other in case you want to compare. Let me disable uh, uh, um, 17, uh, 2017 and 2018. Um, as I explained before, the forecast drives the optimization. So it is utmost important to have it right. Yeah? Um, based on the historical data and the external factors the system produces a forecast as accurate as possible but there may be information the system doesn't know about like uh, exceptional business opportunities or business expansion for these cases the forecast can be uh, manually adjusted yeah there is a manual uh, adjustment uh, either it comes uh, by user entry or uh, integrated from the tms If I go to the planning section, um, this part, I just picked the service repositioning. Um, this is kind of the heart of the product. Um, this is a very heavy screen with a lot of data, but it consolidates basically all the information we have to help the planner to make the right decision. Uh, on the top, you see the vessels. On the left side, you see the port of this specific service and uh, its intersection blocks. Uh, these are actually the port calls. You can see the stock levels. Uh, um, you can see uh, the stock at the arrival. You can see the stock at the departure. You can see the activities during the port call. And um, you can see uh, the what is on the vessel at the moment of arrival. Yeah. Once again, this is all future data. So we just uh, predict the future and then we play uh, uh, all the activities and uh, propose them. Uh, 
there is also something called safety stock. I want to talk about it uh, uh, briefly uh, because uh, some companies call it a working stock target inventory, but I think you understand what it is. Um, unlike most of the companies where the safety stock is more or less a static number, in trust metrics, it's fully dynamic. Like the demand, it changes every day. The safety stock is determined by, uh, by a model uh, using several factors. Uh, for, first, uh, uh, sorry, uh, first and most important is the demand. Like the demand, the safety stock follows a certain seasonality. Because, uh, yeah, if you have a, a very seasonal pattern for your demand, uh, for your demand, there is no point to keep the same safety stock uh, uh, through the whole year. Secondly, uh, the safety stock depends on the forecast accuracy. Uh, the better the forecast is, the less safety stock you need to keep. And if I turn it around, you can compensate lower forecast accuracy for certain location with a higher safety stock. And last but not least, uh, it depends on the resupply time of empty containers. So the further your uh, surplus, uh, surplus locations are, the higher the safety stock is normally. Um, this screen is a service-oriented view of the optimization results, but uh, we have several other views for different uh, use cases. If I expand it a bit, you can see more details. Uh, you can see the full container activities, the bookings, the forecast, and you can see what we actually propose to do with the empties. In this case, uh, the system proposes to send uh, 178 empties to, uh, from Rotterdam to uh, Portugal, uh, three to Spain, and uh, from the 40 uh, high cubes, uh, 155 to France. You may accept it or you may override it. So you can click and you can enter the instruction and you say, okay, the number is fine, but I want to send 78 to France instead and 100 to Portugal. If you save it, the system automatically recalculates uh, future stock levels at this location. It also recalculates what is on the vessel at, uh, at a certain point. And you see that the numbers show up at the destination. So it, uh, it uh, propagates the change. Um, this can be integrated back to the uh, TMS, as, as Dimitar mentioned, and uh, creating an, an um, empty repositioning order. Let me go to the next screen. Uh, container shortages. Uh, this is an interesting one. Uh, we are going uh, more to strategic decisions. Um, since, we, uh, since the system predicts the future demand and the stock levels are kind of known, we can report unsatisfied demand. Uh, unsatisfied demand means that there is simply no container to give to the customer and there is no way, according to the network, um, to move the containers there in time. Uh, for the first couple of weeks, the system cannot find a way to move them. So these are the location and container types, uh, which couldn't be satisfied. But it's a very valuable information for the, for the planner because uh, they can take uh, proactive actions uh, to mitigate the, these problems, for example, by short-term leasing a container. The important is that uh, over time it goes to zero. So there are enough containers. So the fleet size is fine to, to serve the business. The lower chart uh, shows the safety stock violations, meaning that your stock levels are below the safety stock. So the higher the column, the more you are below the desired level. High numbers in this case, uh, are not directly a problem 
like in the upper chart where you really lose business but uh, a, a very important indication that your fleet size is uh, maybe small so uh, if these bars don't go to zero by time like here but they stay high uh, that means that the system is not able to refill the safety stock even in 12 weeks time But as long as uh, both chart tend to zero over time, uh, like here, you have enough containers to serve your business. So this is a very nice looking uh, uh, situation. So the fleet size is, uh, is large enough to, uh, to satisfy the demand, but also to refill your safety stock. Uh, another uh, uh, report for uh for a, for a kind of strategic decision is is the container fleet and this one shows you the uh, global uh, on a global level uh what the containers are doing so on a da daily basis you can see how many containers are uh, land inventory meaning um, sitting in the depot idle empty land inventory full uh, sea inventory so traveling on sea empty uh, full and the export and import cycle so the the stuffing and the emptying of the containers um, this uh, this uh, report helps you to analyze how your business develops looking at uh, the number of containers doing uh, actual business i mean being full or being uh, stuffed or emptied and uh, you can also uh, monitor your um, empty uh, stock levels, your idle containers, and uh, draw conclusions that your fleet size may be too high if your uh, idle uh, uh, fleet is, is increasing. In this example, it's nicely decreasing the idle fleet, so it, uh, it, looks, uh, it looks very good. And the last one, I just took one from the reporting section, just to um, show you what we do on the reporting side. Um, um, this is the uh, this is the uh, the story so cost chart is to uh, to monitor the stock levels and the cost uh, development for um, for certain countries, port or specific depots or terminals. I picked a location with a monthly free pool and with uh, relatively high rates above the free pool. Uh, the orange line represents in this example, the free pool. The, slowly, so, uh, the solid blue line shows uh, the historical balances on a daily basis. The dotted line shows the trend and the dashed line shows uh, the future projection. Uh, this is what the, uh, what the optimization uh, proposes. Yeah. What you can see here is uh, that the stock builds up far above the free pool, yeah, resulting in high monthly invoices. You can see yeah, there are very high invoices. But actually, uh, the more than 1,000 TEUs are sitting idle. I mean, there was this uh, 700, but most of the cases, 100 TEUs are sitting there uh, at this depot, idle, and yeah, and you receive the high invoices every month. Um, what you can see, look at what the optimization proposes. It proposes to build it down below the, uh, the stock level, uh, below the, uh, the free pool, while satisfying customer demand and uh, keeping the a healthy safety stock. Because you saw on the previous screens that uh, all the demand in the future is satisfied and the safety stocks are healthy and uh, refilled. And uh, this specific location can um uh, uh can serve 
uh, the business even uh, below the free pool resulting in much friendlier invoices for October and November. Uh, this is all what I wanted to show you, just as a brief, be, a brief introduction, and uh, I give the word uh, uh, back to, to John. Thank you, uh, Malou. So just before to... Um, to um, to continue, so you have a chat box you know, on your screen. Uh, you have also a question box, so feel free to ask any question. You don't have uh, any question yet, so feel free. And then you have also uh, a section which is called polls. And in the, the, the section, we are actually asking you three questions. So uh, thank you in advance to just reply to those questions. So you can just uh, select your, your reply, sir. Be done in a couple of seconds. So, uh, yeah, if you can just uh, reply to that, that would be great. Thank you in advance. So, um, and thank you, Dimitar. Thank you, uh, Balu, for for the presentation. Here on the on the slide, you have a summary of uh, the type of saving that you can achieve achieve actually by actually using uh, uh, this technology. So, empty container repositioning, which is actually the cost of moving the container. It can actually get uh, be cut by 10%. This is what we have seen with, our, with a couple of our customers. There is another thing that, uh, that generally happens around the, the local port or depot. Generally, you know, the local manager keep a higher safety stock in order to be able to serve the end customer. And this is fully understandable by actually giving more visibility and, uh, and being better at actually predicting what will be the future uh, of, in terms of needs. Generally, we're also able to help the, the customer to actually reduce the stock of, uh, of container. So what you have seen in, our, in the past is there up to 12% decrease in terms of a number of, of containers. And last but not the least, regarding the storage cost, you know, generally, you know, it depends on the model, the model you have actually negotiated with the port or with the depot, but generally you have a free pool, you know, for a certain number of days where you can actually keep the container you know, stored when it's part of your pricing model, and then you start to pay. Taking that in consideration when we actually reposition or we actually give the planning of repositioning to the planning team, we are able generally to save up to 30% of our of storage cost. So this is uh, this is generally what uh, what you achieve in terms of, uh, of, uh, of savings. So um, that's uh, that's all for, for today. I will uh, I will let the I will let the, the presentation open for, for a couple of questions. So um, we have re received, I think, several questions over email before the session. So um, maybe we can start with the first one. And meantime, you know, if you have other questions, just feel free to ask it, you know, in the in the question box. So the, the first question is what variables are considered to determine the level of a safety stock? Maybe a question for, for you, Balu. So the parameters to actually determine these are in this safety stock level. Um, yeah, can you hear me? Yes. Yeah. yeah, okay. So I'm not sure if the question comes after the after me, uh, Dimitar's slide or after my explanation, but uh, let me uh, uh, repeat it. So uh, in general, the safety stock follows a, follows a pattern of the demand. Um, usually um, shifted backwards in time because the uh, uh, the, the pickup moments are earlier than the uh, the, the, uh, the actual full load. Um, um, secondly, uh, it depends on the accuracy uh, because uh, I mean our, our forecasting uh, can um, can give you uh, ranges so with uh, with certain percentage this is the uh, the the value uh, if you want to have a higher percentage then then we can give a range um, so we uh, based on the accuracy of the forecast we can we can play with the safety stock so we can increase the safety stocks to fix uh, forecast accuracies if you have a very accurate forecast then uh, then it's not needed and the third one is um, is the is the transit time to resupply the location. And obviously there is also a factor uh, uh, of the customer. 
so how safe the customer wants to be so this this is the fourth uh, parameter i would say okay thank you balu there is another interesting question so how to balance the machine learning forecast with the commercial forecast so basically machine learning there's the human input Nico, do you want to take this one maybe yeah sure um, it's a good question but i think it's not a either or um, again we're talking about augmented intelligence here so the, the machine learning output can only be uh, improved and can only help actually to enhance the capabilities of the planner Sometimes um, the demand forecasts are not that accurate just because there is nothing to learn from in the data. Sometimes orders come uh, via email or they would come, and, and we're talking about big orders occasionally, uh, they could come over the phone. And in these cases, before the data is actually entered into the system and, and we have no visibility over it, then the planner can act and uh, manually adjust the forecast. And that's the beauty of the system that it, it actually takes the best of both data analytics and the human touch and uh, experience, even if you wish, of the planner. Yeah, okay, yeah. Thank you, Mirko. Another one, and, and that was linked maybe to what you discussed earlier in this presentation, does the optimization facilitate augmented intelligence? So maybe just a quick reminder about what we call augmented intelligence at, at Transmetrics. Are provided by the by the algorithm. By then you have the uh, we don't hear you, John. I think we lost John actually. I think we lost him. Yeah. Um, um, can you answer the question about the augmented intelligence? Yes. Yeah, I think it's um, it's important because again, um, the, the solution is is, is um, designed so that it can it can take the best out of both the human factor and the machine um, that uh, analyzes the data and outputs uh, what is most likely to happen. And again, the the demand forecast is not only based on the previous data, historical data of our clients, but it's also a combination of that being significantly improved in terms of quality but also a set of external factors that have a huge impact on demand. Uh, this could be things like public holidays, like industry seasonality, um, or basically anything that can affect the volumes of our clients. Yeah. Thank you, Mitko. And sorry, I've been disconnected. Sorry for that. So, um, and um, yeah, a couple of questions, but uh, we are running short of time. So I will maybe ask the last question we, are, we have here. So, um, and by, Balu, maybe it's for you this one. So, how to cope with last minute changes in the forecast? Manual input by the user or transmetric support? Uh, um, last minute changes? Yeah, in the forecast. How do we cope with that? Uh, I mean, uh, manual entry, uh, usually. I mean, we have this daily cycle um, right now. So um, if last minute means that um, for the next day, then uh, uh, then uh, yeah, you update the forecast, uh, you you put it uh, move it up and up or down for certain locations or regions, and uh, and then uh, rerun the optimization. I mean the optimization will run every night every night, but uh, I mean if uh, if really a last minute, then we can we can do a optimization run during the day and taking the uh, the forecast into account yeah. okay thank you so um, so we are exactly on time thank you all for joining or joining us so the webinar will be accessible online so for everyone who actually are signed up you will have access to the to the online uh, video and stay tuned for the next webinars on supply chain and optimizing supply chain that will be actually hosted by Transmetrics over the, the next coming months. So thank you for joining and looking forward to a venue for the next one. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, guys.